So, building your own GIA uh, configuration. Uh, there have been a lot of talks about GIA already. There's going to be a fantastic talk on GIA tomorrow as well by Alexander. So, I, I feel I'm in the presence of the GIA master here, so please be gentle. Uh, what we'll be covering today is uh, what is GIA? Uh, how many of you have actually used GIA already? So I can <coughs> guess the level. Okay, that's perfect. Uh, in this session, I'll do a bit of an intro to GIA. Uh, after that, I'll show a couple of different ways we can set up configurations and uh, different scenarios. Um, and uh, what, else, uh, what else is there? So let's get into it. Uh, why would you use GIA? Well, there's a number of reasons uh, you, uh, you could use it. Uh, you can secure your, uh, uh, your PowerShell access to systems. So this is uh, if, you, uh, have, if you access a lot of servers in your environment and you mostly exclusively do it using PowerShell, then GIA is a good solution. If half of the time you're RDPing into your servers, then GIA might not be the best solution because then you can still break stuff another way. Um, you want to reduce the amount of people that can do everything in your environment. Uh, I know it's still the case uh, with many of my clients. Uh, everyone is just admin or even worse, everyone is domain admin. So that's probably, uh, that, well, that's not probably, that's definitely the scenario we need to get away from. Uh, and uh, part of GI is you will be able to see what people are doing uh, on your systems. Uh, this is not exclusive to GIA. Uh, if you attended my session yesterday, I talked a bit about PowerShell logging. PowerShell logging is also a very important part of GIA. So, um, so how to use uh, how to use GIA? Uh, it's standard in most. Uh, it's included in most recent operating systems. So, uh, Windows 10, uh, Server 2016. Uh, for the down-level operating systems, uh, you can download the WMF5, so that includes uh, includes everything. Um, oh, did I say WMF5 or 5.1? 5, 5. 5, okay, so I meant 5.1 because 5.1 is better. So if you're running uh, uh, Windows 10 pre-anniversary, you probably want to update it to anniversary edition so you get PowerShell 5.1. Uh, oh, okay, I thought it, no, I, I've been on Insider Build, so I'm a little bit disconnected to the actual releases. Uh, my Windows system is also an Insider Build, so uh, some things are not working, but all the things I need to do for this demo are working, hopefully. <laughs> Uh, yeah, so WMF 5.1, uh, we want to enable PowerShell, uh, we want to enable PowerShell remoting. Uh, it's enabled by default on uh, recent server operating systems, uh, starting from uh, server 2012. Uh, and we want to enable PowerShell logging. It's not mandatory, but it is something that will help you uh, to know what's going on with, uh, with your servers. Uh, I recommend... Uh, enabling that. So what I'll be doing now, um, I'll be creating a first year configuration. I will do this by uh, creating a, a role capability. I'll attach it to a GIA configuration and I'll show you uh, the whole process of building this. Uh, the system I'm building this on is uh, just my own laptop. Uh, in later demos, I will be working with a domain controller slash Hyper-P server to show you some different roles. Uh, if at any point anything is unclear, what I'm showing, uh, or I'm going too fast, too slow, just let me know. Uh, it's interactive, so you can just shout out when you see something you want to know more about. Okay. So 
So the first thing I'll do is I'll create a Go capability file. A Go, ca Go capability file defines uh, what kind of actions a certain Go can do. I'll explain uh, later what a Go is exactly and how it ties into your PowerShell configurations. But first we're going to take a look at what uh, such a file looks like. So I'll just create one called first year Go and we'll take a look in ISE. So what we can see is it gets a unique uh, GUID. There's a bunch of information like the author and uh, who published it. And you can see there's a number of uh, number of fields we can fill in. We can uh, define which modules are imported, with which aliases, which functions, uh, which external commands. So external commands, think of ping.exe or uh, as I'll be showing later on, who am I.exe. Uh, we also have options of uh, showing visible providers. Uh, does, uh, does everyone know what PowerShell providers are? Okay. Matt, can you name a PowerShell provider? Yeah. Ah, that's the easy one. <laughs> hmm? yep. Yes. <laughs> WS Man is... Uh, Indeed, one we'll be uh, seeing a lot when we're doing uh, when we're working with Gia. Uh, so, uh, furthermore, what we can do is we can uh, define our own functions in here. Uh, this is intended to have uh, uh, intended to write small functions. If you're writing advanced functions that you want to make available in your Gia sessions, you want to inc incorporate them into a module that get loaded once uh, once uh, your Gia session is started. Okay, so let's create our first. Uh, let's create our first uh, PS capability file. Uh, what I'm going to do first is going to show what kind of parameters we have available. I have a short uh, function that makes it easier to read the help. So, all the things we could define, uh, all the uh, settings we can set in the PSO capability file are also available here. So let's see how we can use this. So what I'll be configuring is a very simple configuration, about as basic as you can get. Uh, I'm going to enable two commandlets, get process and get sim instance. So I'm putting this in a hash table. I'll be, uh, uh, I'll be using splatting a lot in all my demonstrations. Uh, <coughs> Is everyone aware what splitting is and how it works? Nice. I don't like backticks in my presentations. Yeah. Here we go. Let's take a look at the contents of the file. So this is a very similar file to the file we just saw. And to make it a little bit more readable what is actually in the file, uh, I'll use regex <laughs> to uh, to remove all the lines that uh, start with a with a comment, so we can see what is actually configured in the file. So we can see what we have is the GUID, the offer, uh, company name. I also don't know the company, so. And the only thing that's actually configured here is uh, get process and get sim instance. So the next thing we'll be doing is we'll create a PS session configuration file. And we'll just briefly show what is available there for configuration and afterwards we'll actually create one. So see here it's a configure it has a similar uh, similar structure as the PS role capability file. So let's deploy the uh, the Go capability file that I just created. I'll put it in uh, C program files, uh, C program files Windows PowerShell uh, demo one GM. I'll show what kind of uh, what kind of files are available here. So uh, what we need is we need a basic module in one of the uh, one of the module uh, one of the folders that's in the in your environment variable model path. Uh, 
it doesn't actually have to be a module, but there has to be a folder there called row capabilities, and that's where you put your row configuration. Uh, this is important because we will be calling this configuration later when we're creating our uh, uh, for our session configuration. Um, is this clear? Did I explain this proper? Right. So then we'll get to a new session configuration file. That's what we, uh, this is where we're going to use the Go configuration we just created. So you can see there's a lot of, uh, a lot of parameters available here as well. But since we're creating a basic configuration, all we're going to do is we're going to give Yap Grasser access to the first GIA Go capability. So that's the file we just created in which we said uh, get process and uh, get same instance. We'll make it a restricted remote server, which means that the language mode is uh, restricted. PowerShell language mode uh, is something you should always restrict when you're using GIA because otherwise it's very easy to break out. Uh, no language, yeah. Yes, thank you. So we'll execute this and create the file. <coughs> we'll verify if the file was created uh, successfully, which it has. And so now we've created the session configuration, but it's not, uh, not yet registered uh, as a uh, PowerShell endpoint. So in our next command, we'll uh, take a look at which, uh, which configurations are available by, uh, by default. So we have PowerShell, PowerShell Workflow, and PowerShell 32. Uh, if you would run this on the server, uh, you would also get uh, Server Manager as a configuration. So let's register this as my first year. There we go, and as we just mentioned, there's uh, different PowerShell providers, and this is indeed the WSMAN uh, PowerShell provider. That's where uh, this is configured. So let's connect to this, uh, to this session. So we'll take a look at enter PS session. It's a command that we, that we use to uh, connect to other systems using uh, WinRM. We'll configure the GIA session. We don't have to specify credentials because we're just using my account. So I'm up. And we'll connect to this session. Uh, I'm not going to go into the session. I'll be accessing the GIA session using invoke command. Uh, because uh, if I use uh, enter PS session, uh, I've noticed that when I'm doing demos, I always forget to get out of it and then my demos break. So we'll get process. And you can see we get the same results we would normally get. We only get an extra, uh, we do get an extra column, uh, localhost, uh, a PS computer name, which is localhost. So let's do what I said I wouldn't do, get, go into PS session. We'll execute get command. And what we will see is that the two commandlets that we have de defined, the same instance and get process, uh, they are available. And we have a number of uh, helper functions that allow us to work with PowerShell as we would expect. Notice that select object, uh, it's a function, it's not a commandlet. It does not allow you to do everything you would uh, normally do with, uh, with select object. So if you want select object to be available, then uh, you should also specify it. So to give an example of the no language mode, if we execute get process in this session, it works as expected. But if we try to assign this to a variable, it's not allowed because it's in no language mode. So let's get out of this session before I forget to get out of it. So if we want to assign this to a variable, what we just do is we call invoke command and we assign it directly to a variable. There 
we go. Now if we take a look at PS, we just look at the first five entries, otherwise we get too much. We have the output uh, that we expected. So if we take a look at the PS session configuration, we can now see that we also have an additional uh, configuration here called my first year. <coughs> All right. So in the next, uh, what I'm going to show now is I'm going to start up Notepad, and after I uh, after I start Notepad, I will attempt to stop it using this GI configuration. So let's see how this goes. If I try to do this. I'll minimize this one again. We'll first do get process notepad, which works as expected because we specified uh, get process. Uh, can I get a show of hands? Who thinks this will work if I execute it like this? All right. It does indeed not work because it doesn't know what stop process is. I already showed it with get command. It stop process is not available. So what I could do now, I could either use the commandlets to update my uh, PS role uh, capability file, or I can just edit it using a text editor. Um, because I already showed you how to do it with a commandlet, I'll show how to do it with a text editor. Uh, on production systems, don't use a text editor, because if you use a text editor and you put a space or a, uh, a semicolon, you miss any character, you'll break your entire configuration. Commandlets. And we'll add in stop process. So who thinks it will work now? All right. Exactly, it will still not work. Uh, the, but the only the, the only thing we need to do now is connect again to the session, and the new uh, our new GIA session will automatically use the new role definition. So here I'm connecting again to my GIA session, assigning it to GIA session, and now if I run the same command, it's available, and it will ask us if we actually want to stop Notepad, which in this case we do. All right, so this was a short demonstration of the of the basics of GM. Uh, we created a Go capability file. Uh, we configured it with the settings we wanted. We just said you can do SIM instance and you can do uh, get process. Uh, we created a configuration file and we registered it as an endpoint. And then when we found out that our GIA configuration wasn't working as intended, we went into the uh, Go capability, we updated it, and from that point on, after we updated it, uh, every new session will use the updated uh, updated role capability. What, what is the, the difference between the, the current and session configuration file and part of the core yeah. um, against with the original capability file? Because uh, the visibility of function from my office has always been possible to configure the part of the core. Yeah. But the Go capability file, that's uh, th uh, that's a new uh, feature in PowerShell 5. 5 or 5.1? I'm not sure. Yeah? Yeah. So that became available in 5.1. And what this allows you to do is you can uh, define uh, you can define a Go capability and you can assign <laughs> it to uh, multiple users or multiple groups. Or you can give a single user access to multiple Go capabilities. So once you, uh, for yourself, you define a definition of uh, a set of uh, a set of commands that someone would be able to execute in a certain role, you would put it in a Go capability, and then you can assign it to uh, whichever user you uh, you want to assign it to. Does that make sense? Yeah. 
special preservation file, which is the browser space. And for technical compatibility to the browser file, you still have to go to the parameters. Don't make them withdraw the compatibility file. Mm -hmm. Because if you do that, you are going against the nature of the You have to use raw compatibility file in combination with the session configuration to make that match. But Chrome specifies that uh, something in raw compatibility file is not going to be parameters here because then you will mix those things together. And that's not the point. So, for example, we have a thing maybe we can read right now, maybe we will probably talk about it. You don't use the static one as a credential together with this virtual client. So, the thing is, virtual account is false, but set private account as a parameter for the file. So, you need to maintain the package for compatibility, so this is why we like that false still. But try to focus on the classic tools that damage the day. And you work with a pure GM setup. Otherwise, you will have a problem. Hey, yes. Okay. So my understanding is right, we call correct all the files that are in the right? That's correct. So theoretically if we put some duty to the counter to use a choice, you would have locked out the file. I would have locked out myself? Would why would I have locked out myself? Because you have a default because you already have a low compatibility file. Yeah. Uh, no, that's not the case. Um, well, if you make the configuration file disappear, uh, it it will expose uh, uh, that the GIA configuration will not work. But that. That, uh, that is correct, but uh, what you should do with your GIA configuration files, you should uh, put them in a location. That's why I put them in uh, program files, uh, Windows PowerShell. Only administrators can, uh, can edit that. But if someone scary, like, uh, like Will, is on your system and he managed to become an admin or get system privilege, well, then it doesn't matter what kind of capabilities you set up. The moment someone's admin, he can mess up your system, including GM. Uh, there was a second question as well, right? Okay. Yeah. No, the, this, the session configuration uh, is stored there, but it refers to the raw capability. Exactly. You would, have, you would have access to overwrite the rules of the game. Yes. But obviously, you need to be very mindful of what you're exposing in the game to, to not enable uh, bypass of those things <coughs> like infection downstream. Yep, that's correct. So um, I'll do it for the recording because it was probably not picked up. Uh, what Will said is uh, when you're creating a GIA configuration, 
Oh, sorry, Matt. <laughs> Other scary skirt guy. <laughs> You're featured in my uh, presentation tomorrow, by the way. <laughs> Uh, what, what Matt mentioned is uh, you have to be very careful when you're uh, configuring your GIA, uh, when you're setting up your GIA configuration. Uh, he gave an example that uh, if you give someone access to the file system and he can edit the GIA and he finds out where uh, the Go capability file is stored, he could edit, potentially edit that. Uh, that's one of the threats. Uh, there's a lot of other things that can go wrong if you if you misconfigure your GIA. If, for example, you have the new service uh, commandlet or anything along those lines, uh, uh, the default configuration gives you local admin on the system. So if you're local admin and you expose too much in your GIA configuration, people can escalate that up and become admin on the system as well. So you have to be very careful when you're configuring your GIA. Any more questions? Oh, one last thing I want to add to that one. Uh, the default configurations that, uh, that Microsoft, are they online somewhere? What was it again? There were some default uh, GIA configurations that actually allowed for escalation of privilege. They're on GitHub, yeah. Yeah. Well, they, 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 they fixed them? Fix them? Okay. Uh, so what I mentioned, apparently it has been fixed. Last time I checked, uh, the default GIA configurations that were released actually had some of those security uh, problems. But it's fixed. All right. So in our next example, uh, I'll use a typical help desk user. Uh, the help desk user needs to be able to do a couple of things. He needs to be able to reset passwords. He need, needs to be able to uh, uh, disable accounts and unlock accounts. And I'll create a GI configuration for that. Uh, GI is one way of doing this. You could also assign uh, permissions, uh, uh, permissions in Active Directory that allow the user to do this. The disadvantage of that is that you would still need uh, Active Directory tools installed on a system. And if you have a very large help desk, then uh, you'll have to deploy it on all their systems. So what I'll do now, I'll connect to, uh, I'll connect to my domain controller. <coughs> and I'll show you the two users that, I, uh, that I'm going to use in this demo. So I have help desk user and Hyper-V admin. Uh, they're both not members of any group, so they're just uh, regular users. <coughs> and what I'll do is I'll store their credentials in a CRED file, and uh, this way I can emulate a user logging on uh, on this system. So I've already stored it, so I won't bother you with typing my password. So now we have help desk user and Hyper-V admin. We'll be using that uh, throughout the presentation. So the first thing I'll do is I'm going to uh, build my configuration uh, from scratch again, uh, what I just did as well. So the first thing I do is I'll create a folder, uh, GI configurations, uh, and a folder, Go capabilities. And to show you I'm not making it up, I'll show that everything is empty here right now, and we'll go completely from scratch. So first I'll create the folder structure. Miss it? Ah, thank you. So now we created two folders and one file. GR configurations of PSM1. Uh, the module file should just exist. It doesn't have to do anything. We'll create a module manifest there. And we'll take a look at what's in there exactly. So you can see we just have one folder and two files. So now we'll create the Go capability file again, this time for a help desk user. Uh, we're going to give a number of commandlets. We're going to give 
uh, get AD computer, get AD user, unlock AD account, disable AD account, and set AD password. Uh, furthermore, I'm going to uh, put who am I in there. So who am I is just a simple program that tells us who we are and can also tell us what kind of privileges we have. And we specify the path where it's stored, which is in program files again. So we created it. We'll create, uh, create the session configuration file. And we'll register this again. So let's connect to this uh, configuration. We'll first uh, take a look which configurations we have available. So we can see our new awesome session has been created. We have our credentials available. So the first thing I'll do, uh, I just missed to, uh, yeah, everything is there. Good. Uh, we'll try to connect to the session. Uh, we'll connect to the help desk account management, the local system again, and we'll use Hyper-V admin. Uh, note that I made this one for the help desk user, so I'll show how this one will fail. So here we see we just get access denied. So if we take a look at our <coughs> configuration for the help desk user, we can see this is how we define that. We put this in the role definition. We say awesome help desk user gets the capability <coughs> help desk user. So this is how we can specify who gets what access. Uh, right now I use a user account. You can also use an AD group. So we'll now import the session correctly using help desk user. And we'll invoke uh, whoami.exe. So we can see we're connected as a virtual user because I enabled a virtual user. And we're now connected as WinRM Awesome Help Desk User. Uh, this username is going to be different every time and it's very much random. So if I execute it, uh, if I connect again, You can see it's very random because now it's two and it was one before. Very unexpected. So the first thing we'll do, uh, we'll let the user connect to, uh, uh, we'll let, uh, let the help desk user query for user A. You can see we get the information. We'll query for the computers in the domain. We'll be able to do that. Let's try to unlock the ID account. Also works as expected. You can even set the ID account password. We'll get a pop-up and a warning saying that uh, the system, uh, the remote system is asking for secure input. So let's give it a nice new password. <coughs> There we go. We reset the password for the user. Now, there is a small problem with this. The help desk user is now also able to disable the user account of administrator, which is something we don't want. So, let's go fix that by going into the role capability. And what I'll do now is I'm going to create a function get user and I'm going to pipe it to where object to make sure uh, administrator is not in the result. Let's see, function definitions. And we'll remove uh, get ad user from the commands. So 
So now we are still connected to our old session. So if we check for get ad user, we can see it's still available. Now if we connect again, we'll see we get an error for get ad user because it's no longer there, and get user is available. So now we can still use get user as expected. Uh, did I break it? I break something. Okay, let me take a quick look, see if I can fix it fast. Oh, this one should not be in here. There we go. All right, let's do that again. Go we'll connect to the session again. And now we can still query for user A. But if we query for administrator, we won't get a result anymore. Uh, I show this one as an example, because normally we don't want to pipe the results into where object because it's very inefficient. Normally what you would do is you would either uh, create, uh, you would create a module in which you have a, uh, a proxy command, or you could set a default value for uh, for the parameter, so it's always looking in uh, in users instead of uh, administrative users. I don't think the session configuration is secure now. No. Yes. Right? Yeah. So the way how you treated it is you use some kind of blacklisting thing because of the dimension. Yeah. A better approach would be to use a whitelisting then for which those accounts that you can actually work with in a full you and then filter that way. Say like okay, this is the account that you can see. Yeah. That's not the other one, right? Exactly. So what Alexander is saying that this is not a correct approach for uh, uh, for a production scenario. For the demo pur purpose, I can show an easy function that filters out using where object. Uh, what you would like to do is you would like to have some distinguish. Uh, you would like to distinguish by OU or uh, a property. Yes. Yeah, you could, uh, you, yeah. Yes. So this, uh, the question, the question was what kind of permissions does the, uh, this account have? It has local administrative permissions and as you probably know, local administrator on the domain controller means uh, domain admin or enterprise admin. Well, if it's a if, if it's a forest? okay yes uh, so the the way it works if so the question is what happens if you have a, a, a if you have multiple groups with multiple role definitions uh, which privilege wins? So the privilege that, that wins, uh, it's basically everything that you fall under, that's what you get. So if you're part of the help desk group and the Hyper-V admin group, then you would get uh, you would get both roles assigned to you, if that's how you configured your uh, session configuration. Uh, so the question is, wh what will happen if you have conflicting functions? You have uh, two different functions defined in two different uh, in two different role definitions. Uh, well, that's a problem not exclusive to Gia. If you have multiple uh, multiple functions with the same name, then you have to be yeah, well. You have to specify which one you want to use. Yeah. 
You can have you can have dozens. I can go back to the configuration. I'll show. Uh, let's go to where I configured it. Uh, so here we have the role definitions. So we can place. We, we can place as many groups and as many users and for every uh, for, for every help desk user uh, for example for the help desk user we could also assign more row capabilities the, the same way we were defining uh, the, the same way we we were defining yes This is in the Go capability file. So the roles are defined in the Go capability files. So it does not exist. Uh, does not exist. Uh, this one is not there. But if we would have de defined this one, then it would also uh, the help desk user would also get access to whatever is defined in there. And the question that was asked: What if it's conflicting? Then the most permissive wins. That that is not calculated. No, that is not. no so yeah. The the most permissive if you do it in a GIA configuration, if you make your own custom functions, that cannot be evaluated by GIA. Th then you have a conflict. I, I think both, Alex, can I uh, interject? Uh, I think the, both functions will be available if you have two of the same functions defined, or will there only be one function available? Yes, I'm, I'm not sure about if you have two functions with the same name and two roles of facilities by what they have. I'm not sure about that. I, I, I know that when you talk about restricting command lists, in a way that you're restricting the need from parameters, or you restrict the potential uh, value, parameter values, then the one that can give you more of the capabilities, that one will be used. But what would happen if you have two functions with the same name in both? I can't reply that. Anyway. So it probably it would work in the same way as it worked when you were restricting command lists, because I have somehow to manage if one function 
work with two parameters, the other one works with one parameter, but I can only talk to that, so I don't know. But that merging part is not, the algorithm is not, I can say it's not ready because now the power theory is open source, so we should use that code as good as we are actually how the merging algorithm works. But it is a pretty much complex, I think. But it is interesting. And the most uh, important part in the work of GA is actually design phase. When you need to decide what are the actual role possibilities while the demand exists, that's the other part of everything. How do you decide which is correct? Well, I know. Really? Okay. I mean, we can talk. Um, so I'm almost out of time. I'm just going to do my, my, my last demo. Uh, yeah, yeah we, we have some more time, but what I'll do is uh, I'll give the last demo, and after the last demo, we'll continue the discussion. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> okay. All right. So, last demo. We'll create a very basic configuration for Hyper-V admin. Uh, here we go. So, we'll do exactly the same again. Uh, the only difference is uh, this line. We'll do get VM, start VM, and stop VM. And the goal definition is different. Uh, uh, he will get Hyper-V and for Hyper-V admin. Um, those are the only two differences we are configured. Yes. So I'll just execute this entire region. And We'll do the same thing again. We'll list the configurations. So we can see now we have Hyper-V VM management configured. And we'll connect to the session. We'll show that uh, this normal user that doesn't actually have permissions to do this can now run get VM against a Hyper-V server. Let's see, we get all our VMs. <coughs> and we can see what would happen if uh, we would do start VM. So this works pretty much as you would expect. One of the issues that I'm running into when, I'm, uh, uh, when I was trying to push GIA for our, co uh, for our situation in, uh, in my office is that most people are actually uh, not using PowerShell yet. So uh, that's something I still run into, and you get uh, you get kind of the same answer every time. Yes, I'm too busy. Uh, if I just click it now, then it will be fixed, and I I can't learn PowerShell right now. So to show what we can do to work around that, we can also use GIA endpoints and build some kind of GUI around it. Uh, because, well, I'm not a GUI designer, so I just went for the minimal viable product here. So I use Outlet View. So I still do the same thing. I do info command hyper-v session. I will get all the VMs. I will pipe this into Outlet <coughs> View. And then I will pipe that again into the hyper-v session to be able to start or stop the VMs. So let's see what it would look like if we would give this to a user. So there we go. Let's see. We have. Let me fix the main column. We can see we have all the VMs available. They're all turned off. And this user might decide okay, let's turn on a couple of VMs. I have three of them selected. I click OK. And we can see start VM will start all these servers. So if you're a little bit creative and you want to build tools for other people, you can use the GIA, uh, you can use the GIA sessions that you've defined as something to connect to. Then normal users have the permissions to execute everything they need to execute because you're using GIA and there's logging on those servers. You don't have to invest any time in logging. Uh, of what a user is doing, if that's important for your business, because PowerShell logging will take care of that. And you have an easy and neat way for people to 
uh, to access uh, access resources they normally wouldn't have access to. All right. So we'll move on to the questions. Um, I will stick around here for the next 15 minutes or until you guys are out of questions. Uh, thank you very much, uh, very much for your time, and I hope to see you all tomorrow again.